Okay. Here you're given f of x is equal to 2x minus 3, and the instructions there will be laid out like this. In part A, you're going to determine whether the graph opens upward or downward, and then identify the vertex of the parabola, find the x-intercepts, then find the y-intercepts, and then sketch the graph using the intercepts, vertex, and additional points. So let's start with part A is determining whether the parabola opens upward or downward. And to do that, you have to identify what A is. That's going to be the coefficient of your x squared term. Okay? So here's x squared. Its coefficient is the understood. Now, if A is positive, that tells you that the parabola opens upward. Or if it's negative, the parabola opens downward. Okay? So in this case here, your A is positive, And because of that, your problem will be opening upward. And that's just because saying A is greater than zero. Okay. So that's just part A right there. Now part B is to identify the vertex of the I didn't put this in the uh, study sheet, but also we're going to identify the axis of symmetry as well. All right, so let's start by identifying the vertex. We need to know what A is, and we need to know what B is. Establish that A is equal to 1. The B is the coefficient of X. What's the B here? Negative 2. So here, to get the X coordinate of the vertex, you use X equal negative B over 2a, negative b over 2a. Let's do our substitution here. Bring this negative sign over, replace the b with negative 2. So we have negative of negative 2 divided by 2 times a, which is 1. And then negative of negative 2 will be 2. The denominator, 2 times 1 will be 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. So your x-coordinate of this vertex is 1. Now for the y-coordinate of the vertex, take what x is, which is 1, and substitute it for each and every x in f of x. So this means we have 1 squared minus 2 times x, which is 1, is 3. And then we go ahead and just Simplify. 1 squared will be 1 minus 2 times 1, which is 2, minus 3. So here was 1 minus 2 minus 3, negative 4. So the y-coordinate of that vertex is negative 4. So my vertex will be the ordered pair 1, negative And then for the axis of symmetry, that's going to be the x-coordinate of that vertex. And when we find out what x is, that was equal to 1. So the axis of symmetry would be the line x equals 1. And make sure when you identify that axis of symmetry, you do include x equals 2, whatever the x-coordinate of that vertex is. Okay, that's part B. Part C is to identify the x-intercepts. So when you identify the x-intercepts, you let f of x be equal to 0 and solve for x. And here f of x is at x squared minus 2x minus 3. set that equal to zero. Now, since, this is a, since this is a quadratic equation, we'll go ahead and factor that into two binomials here. So x squared breaks up as x and x. Now we need factors of negative three that would give me a minus two x as a middle term. That will have to be 
Well, the only factors of three will have to be three and one. Now, since that middle term is a minus, the larger of the two factors will take the sign of that middle term. So here, the larger is the three, and the middle term is a minus, so the three has to be minus, and the one must be plus. So I have, that, so I have x minus three times x plus one equal to zero. And then we'll set each binomial factor equal to zero and solve. So this means x minus three is equal to zero, and x plus one is equal to zero. And then for each equation, we'll solve for x. So for the x minus 3 equal to 0, of course, if I add 3, I'm going to get x is equal to 3. And then for x plus 1 is equal to 0, if I subtract 1, that means x is equal to 1. So these are my two x-intercepts. It's going to be the ordered pair 3, 0, and the other ordered pair would be negative 1, 0. Those are going to be the points where the graph of that parabola will be crossing the x-axis. Okay, so that's part C. Now part D is finding the y-intercept. Now, to find the y-intercept, we let x equal 0. That means we substitute each and every x in that function with 0. So f of 0 will be this, 0 squared minus 2 times x, which is 0, minus 3. All right, 0 squared will be 0, minus 2 times 0 is 0, minus 3. And if you simplify that, 0 minus 0 is 0. 0 minus 3 will be negative 3. So my y-intercept for this parabola would be the ordered pair 0, negative 3. And then finally, part E is the graph of that parabola. And on the exam, you will have coordinate grids to use to graph your uh, parabolas. All right, so let me pull this up. Now, we already know the vertex, that's going to be 1, negative 4. So here I'm going to go ahead and plot that. So for 1, negative 4, we go to the right 1 and down 4 and draw that point. Also, we know the axis of symmetry. Axis of symmetry, that's x is equal to 1. That's going to be that vertical dotted line going through the x-axis at 1. So here's that vertical dotted line going through the x-axis at 1. All right, next is the uh, x-intercepts. They are 3, 0 and negative 1, 0. So 3, 0 will be on the x-axis here. Negative 1, 0 will be on the x-axis here. Y-intercept is the ordered pair 0, negative 3. So we stay at 0, but go down to negative 3 on the y-axis. Now here's where we come up with an additional point. Take a look at the distance from this y-intercept to the axis of symmetry. That's one place to the left. So the point on the other side of that axis of symmetry must be one place to the right with the same y-coordinate. So it will be that point there. Keep in mind, symmetry means that the left side and the right side are mirror images of each other. So this is all the, these are all the points I'm going to need to 
make the graph of that parabola, and it looks like this. So that would be the graph of the parabola f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3. Okay. Are there any questions about problem number 1? Okay, so it's going to have parts A, B, C, D, and E in it. So you just complete each part. All right, now problem number 2. Here you're given the quadratic function f of x is equal to negative 4x squared plus 160x minus 600. Here you're going to perform the following. In part A, you're to determine without graphing whether the function has a minimum value or a maximum value. Then part B is to find the minimum or maximum value and determine where it occurs. And then part C, identify the function's domain and range. Okay, so... In number two, here's our function. So in part A, we're going to find out whether the function has a minimum value or a maximum value. Well, to do that, we need to identify what A is. The a is the coefficient of your x squared term. So what would a have to be here? Negative 4. Okay, negative 4. And since a is negative, well, let me just say this. If a is positive, then that means you're going to have a minimum value. But if a is negative, you're going to have a maximum value. So in this case here, your a is negative, so that means you're going to have a maximum value. A maximum value will occur because A is negative. Now, had A be, been positive, then it will be a minimum value. So that's all you have to say for part A. Part B is finding out what that maximum value will be and where it occurs. All right, in this case... Let's identify the A and the B. Well, the A, we already know what that is. That's negative 4. What's B going to be equal to? That's the coefficient of X. That's 160. So A is negative 4 and B is 160. Now, here we use X equal negative B over 2A to find out where that maximum value occurs. All right, so now let's simplify by doing some substitution here. Bring this negative sign over, replace the B with 160, so it'll be negative 160 over 2 times A, which is negative 4. So here I got negative 160 in the numerator. 2 times the negative 4 would be negative 8. But what's negative 160 divided by negative 8? 20. So X equals 20 means that the maximum value occurs when x is equal to 20. Now, let's find out what that maximum value is by substituting each and every x in f of x with 20. So that means f of 20 is equal to this, negative 4 times x, which is 20, and that's squared, plus 160 times x, which is 20, minus 600. And I'm going to go ahead and do this. 20 squared is uh, 20 times 20. That will be 400 times that negative 4 would be negative 1,600. Plus 160 times 20 would be 3200, 0, 0, 3200 minus 600. All right, now negative 1,600 plus 3200 minus 600 is how much? A thousand. Because negative 1600 plus 3200, that's 1600, minus the 600 will leave you with a thousand. 
So that 1,000 represents your uh, maximum value. The maximum value here is 1,000. It occurs when x is equal to 20. Okay. Any questions about part B? Now, part C is identifying the functions domain and range. And these are to be given in interval notation. Well, the domain is quite easy because it is a quadratic function, meaning any x value that you assign to it, you will always get that f of x value for it. So that means that the domain of this quadratic function would be infinity to infinity. Now for the range, that's the set of all y values here. Here the maximum value is 1,000. That's the highest y value it would ever reach. So in interval notation for the range, that's going to be from negative infinity up to 1,000. Now if it was a minimum value, then that means you'll write the minimum value first and then it'll be up to infinity. But for maximum, it'll be from negative infinity up to the maximum value of 1,000 because that's the highest y value it would ever reach. Any questions about problem number two? All right, number three. This is parts A and B. And then with number three, you're going to find the vertical asymptote if any of the graph of the rational function. So in part A, we got f of x. f of x is equal to x divided by x minus 4. Now, before you identify your vertical asymptotes, you want to make sure that you have no common factors in them. Well, we just have x and then we have x minus 4. So there are no common factors to divide out. So what we can do here is uh, we can just go ahead and set that denominator to be equal to 0. So here I'm going to take that x minus 4, set that equal to 0. And from there, we'll just go ahead and solve for x. So for the x minus 4 equal to 0, if we add 4, that means x is equal to 4. Okay, so that means here we just go ahead and uh, you know we're going to draw that vertical dotted line at x equals 4. So this will be your vertical asymptote. That's the equation of the line x is equal to 4. So make sure that you do say x equals to whatever that constant is when you identify the vertical asymptote. All right, questions about part A. Now, part B is uh, f of x is equal to x plus 7. And that's divided by x squared plus 4x minus 21. Now, first things first, you want to make sure that you have no common factors. So you want to make sure you factor the numerator and the denominator as far as you possibly can to see if you have any common factors. And if you do, you want to, make, you want to divide those out. Well, the numerator is just going to be x minus 7. However, the denominator of x squared plus 4x minus 21, let's see if we can factor that out into two binomials here. So for the x squared, that's going to be x and x. And then factors of negative 21, that would give me 4x as a middle term, would be what? 7 and 3. Now, of course, that should be x plus 7. You're right. No wonder. Otherwise, we're going to have some problems here. All right.
right? So the large of these two factors would take the sign of the middle term. That 4x is a plus, so that means that the 7 has to be plus and the 3 has to be minus. So I have x plus 7 divided by x plus 7 times x minus 3. Now, notice we have common factors in the numerator and the denominator that we can divide out like this. And I'll have a 1 in the numerator. So this is going to reduce as 1 over x minus 3. And then from there, we can go ahead and identify the vertical asymptote by setting the denominator, which is x minus 3, equal to 0. So when we solve for x, that would mean x is equal to 3. So that means that the vertical asymptote would be that line, x is equal to 3. That's the vertical asymptote here. Now, the one that we divided out was x plus 7. If you were to solve for x by setting it equal to 0, it would be x equal negative 7. And at x equal negative 7, we will have what they call a hole in the graph. Okay. But here we're just asking for the vertical asymptote which is in this case x equals 3. Are there any questions about exit problem number 3, A or B? Okay. Now in problem number 4, problem number 4 is this. We're going to find the horizontal asymptotes, if any, of the graph of the rational function. So in part A, we got f of x is equal to, I'll go ahead and write it out, f of x is equal to 25 x squared divided by 5 x squared plus 1. And here I want to identify that horizontal asymptote. Now the way we do that is we have to identify the n and m and compare those two. Your n is the highest exponent in the numerator. The m is the highest exponent in the denominator. So in this case here, for the n, what's the highest exponent in that numerator? 2. And for the m, what's the highest exponent in the denominator? Also 2. So if I compare n and m, is n equal to, less than, or greater than m? Here's equal to. So that means we have to look at our leading coefficients in the numerator and the denominator to identify the horizontal asymptote. So that means we're going to have y is equal to a sub n divided by b sub m. And here a sub n that's going to be the coefficient of the variable to the highest exponent. In this case, that's 25. B sub m, that's the coefficient of the variable to the highest exponent here as well. That would be 5. Now, what's 25 divided by 5? 5. So that means the horizontal asymptote would be the equation of the line y is equal to 5. Okay. Are there any questions about part A? Part B looks like this. Here we got f of x is equal to negative 15x divided by 5x cubed plus x squared plus 1. And to identify the vertical asymptote here. So 
So N and M are what we're going to need to identify. So for the N, what is the highest exponent in the numerator? Be 1, because that's x to the understood 1. M is the highest exponent in the denominator. What is that? What would that be? Mm -mm. Highest exponent? Three. 3. So now let's compare N with the M. Is N equal to less than or greater than M? This time it's less than. And when N is less than M, then our horizontal asymptote be the equation of the line y is equal to 0 or the x-axis. So y equals 0 will be your horizontal asymptote. <clears throat> Are there any questions about part, part B or part A of problem number 4? Okay, now problem number 5 is where we're going to have to use that seven-step procedure to graph the rational function f of x equals to 4x squared divided by x squared minus 9. Okay, so now, so here's the equation f of x is equal to x squared. 4x squared divided by x squared minus 9. So the first thing we need to do here is identify or determine whether or not we have symmetry and the type of symmetry that we will have for this uh, rational function. Now to do that, we have to... Uh, replace every single x with negative x. So that means in the numerator, I'm going to have 4 times negative x, and that's squared, divided by the denominator, that's negative x, and that's squared, minus 9. And then we simplify the numerator and the denominator. If you square a negative, that's going to be positive. So negative x and u squared will be x squared. So the numerator is 4x squared. And the same thing here. This will be x squared minus 9. Compare what f of negative x ended up being with our original function. They're both the same. So that means here that when I graph this rational function, it's going to be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So here I'm going to have y-axis symmetry for the graph of that rational function. And then number two is finding the y-intercept. That means here I'll let x equals zero. So every x in the f of x function, I'm going to substitute it with zero. So this means I'm going to have four times 0 squared in the numerator divided by 0 squared minus 9 in the denominator. And then we simplify. Well, if I square the 0, that's going to be 0 times 4, which is 0. 0 squared is 0 minus 9. That's negative 9. And 0 divided by negative 9 is 0. So the ordered pair 0, 0 is the y-intercept. Okay. Now for the x-intercept. Now when we find the x-intercept, what you're going to do there is, what you're going to do there is just take the numerator of 4x squared set that equal to zero. And then solve for x. So here if I divide both sides of this equation by four, 
that means x squared is equal to 0. And if I take the square root on both sides here, this means x will be equal to 0. So my x-intercept will be the ordered pair 0, 0, just like uh, the y-intercept. Okay. And now problem number four, I mean, step number four is finding the vertical asymptotes. Now, what you wanna do here is make sure that you have no common factors in this f of x function. So what I would do here is just this. Well, 4x squared is just going to be 4x squared. If I factor x squared minus 9, that's the difference of two squares. x squared would be x and x. Minus 9 would be 3. Well, 9 would be 3 and 3. Since it's a difference, one has to be plus, the other one has to be minus. And I have no common factors to divide out. So I can go ahead and identify my vertical asymptotes by doing this taking that denominator of x plus 3 times x minus 3 and set that equal to 0. And then we set each binomial factor equal to 0 and solve for x. So it'll be x plus 3 is equal to 0 and x minus 3 equal to 0. Solve for x. So for the x plus 3 equal to 0, that means x is equal to negative 3. And then for the x minus 3 is equal to 0, that means x is equal to 3. So these are my two vertical asymptotes, x equal negative 3 and x is equal to 3. Okay. That's step number 4. Now step number 5 is the horizontal asymptote. So that's all where we identify the n and the m. The n is the highest exponent in the numerator. What would that be? Okay. And the m is the highest exponent in the denominator. What would that be? Also 2. And pretty much we can see that n is equal to m. So that means we need to look at our leading coefficients here. a sub n divided by b sub m. Here, that leading coefficient in the numerator, or the number in front of the variable to the highest exponent, that's 4. The denominator, the number in front of the variable to the highest exponent, that's an understood 1. 4 is 4. So y equals 4 is your horizontal asymptote. I'm going to need to move this down a little bit because step six and seven we can do side by side. Step number six will be the table of values here. And then finally, step number seven is graphing it on a coordinate plane, which you'll have coordinate grids on, on your exam. So let's go ahead and graph what we already have. We do have the x and the y-intercept. They're both the same. They're, that's going to be 0, 0, the origin. We do have two vertical asymptotes here. One is at x equals negative 3, and the other one is at x equals positive 3. So I'm going to draw a vertical line or a vertical dotted line going through the x-axis at negative 3 like this, and my other vertical asymptote will be at x equals positive 3, like this. And I do have a horizontal asymptote 
which is y is equal to 4. So that's going to be the horizontal dotted line going through the y-axis at 4. Now the reason I have a table like this is because I'm going to pick values of x between each uh, vertical asymptote and the x-intercept. So like for the x equal negative 3, that's my vertical asymptote. Let's pick values like negative 6, negative 5, and negative 4. And then to the right of that x equal negative 3, negative 2, and negative 1. My x-intercept is at 0, so let's use x equals 1 and 2. My other vertical asymptote is at x equals 3, so let's use x equals 4, 5, 6. And this is where we use our graphing calculator to come up with our f of x values here. All right, so let me go to y equal 2, and I'm going to clear this equation out. Now, for the uh, numerator, 4x squared, I'm going to put that in parentheses. So this will be left parentheses, uh, 4, get the x for the variable x, and then press x squared to square it, and then close the parentheses. Divide that by... For the denominator, x squared minus 9, that needs to be in parentheses. So left parentheses, x t theta n for your x, and then squared for the exponent of 2, minus 9. Close parentheses. And then for the table, you'll press second and graph. And sometimes you may need to use your up arrow key to get to the x value that you want, like I have here. And I'm going to round these off to one decimal place. So like for x equal negative 6, my f of x value would be 5.3. And then for negative 5, I'll use that 6.25. Because I know 0.25 will be 1 fourth as a fraction. And then for negative 4, 9.1. Now at negative 3, you see error. That's one of your vertical asymptotes there. For negative 2, it would be negative 3.2. And for negative 1, it would be negative 0.5. I'm going to use my down arrow key to get to these other values here. Now, 0, 0 is my x and my y intercept. So at 1, that's negative 0.5. So you can see that x equal negative 1 and positive 1 have the same f of x value. So that tells you that it is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Now at 2, negative 3.2. At x equals 3, that's the other vertical asymptote. At 4, 9.1. And then for 5 would be 5.3. And then for... Wait a minute. 4 is 9.1, 5 is 6.25. And 6 is going to be 5.3. Okay, so these are all the points I need to graph this parabola, I mean, rational function. So in this case here, Negative 6 and 5.3 will be to the left 6 and up 5 and about a third of the way up here. 5 and 6.25 will be to the left 5 and up 6 and 1 4. That will be about here. And then 4, negative 4 and 9.1 will be a little bit past 9. That's way up here. So I know what one piece of the graph will look like. If I approach this vertical asymptote of x equal negative 3, this graph would get closer and closer to it, but it won't touch it. And if I go further to the left of negative 3, it's going to get closer and closer to the horizontal asymptote of y equal 4. 
All right, and now for the negative 2 and negative 3.2 will be to the left 2 and down 3 and about 2 tenths of the way here. Negative 1 and negative 1 half would be here. Here's 0, 0. 1 and negative 0.5 would be here. And then 2 and negative 3.2 would be here. So you can see here, this left side has a mirror image of the right side. And this part would get closer and closer to my vertical asymptote of x equal negative 3. And this part right here comes down as well, approaching the vertical asymptote as, at x equals 3. And then for the last three points, that's going to be the, be the mirror image of this on the left side. So the 4 and 9.1 would be here. Let's see, 5 and 6.25 or 6 and 1 fourth would be here. And then 6 and 5.3 would be here. So as I approach that vertical asymptote of x equals 3 on the left, from the left side, it gets closer and closer to it. And if I let x get bigger and bigger, then that part would get closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote of y equal 4. So this is what the graph of f of x is equal to 4x squared divided by x squared minus 9 looks like. Okay. Any questions about problem number 5? All right, number 6. In that particular problem, all we're doing there is just using a calculator to uh, approximate each number and round to three decimal places. So in problem number 6, part A, Here we got 3 to the 2.4 power, and we want to know what that is. Well, to enter that into the calculator, you'll just type in 3.4 and then press the hat key. I mean, I'm sorry. Just type in the number 3 and then the hat key and then 2.4. So 3 hat key, 2.4 and then press enter to get your answer. So the three decimal places, what would this be? It'd be 13.96 what? Seven. Okay, because that third digit is a 6 after the decimal point. To the right of it is another 6, so that 6 increases to a 7. So it would be 13.967 for 3 to the 2.4 power. And then for part B, we got E to the 3.4. So that means for the E, you have to do second and LN. Because right above the LN key is e to the x. And then type in 3.4. And then press enter. So second LN for the e and then 3.4 and then press enter. So to uh, three decimal places, this will be 29.964. Okay. All right, are there any questions about problem number six? All right, problem number seven is finding the accumulated value of a uh, investment for a given time with a given interest rate and the respective compounding. So in number seven, we have an accumulate, we're finding the accumulated value of an investment of $10,000. So that's what P is, $10,000. For five years, that means T is equal to five. 
at an annual interest rate of 8%. What's 8% as a decimal? 0 0.08. And the money is going to be in Part A compounded quarterly. So here's Part A compounded quarterly. And if it's compounded quarterly, that means that N is going to be equal to what? Four. First three months, second three months, third three months, and the last three months. So N is equal to four. And with N number of compounders, we must use this formula. A is equal to P times the quantity one plus R divided by N. That quantity is to the N times T power. So in this case, we just substitute A is equal to P, which is 10,000, times the quantity 1 plus R, that would be 0 0.08, divided by N, which is 4, and that quantity is to the N times T. N is 4, and T is 5. This we can enter directly into the calculator. So if I do 10,000, then left parentheses, 1 plus 0 0.08 divided by 4, close parentheses, press the hat key for the exponent, 4 times 5. Now we always round money amounts to two decimal places, so this will be $14,859.40. Seven cents. Excuse me. All right, so this represents the accumulated value of a ten thousand dollar investment for five years at eight percent compounded quarterly. Now part B says compounded continuously. Now, for continuous compounding, we have to use that other formula that has that natural base E in it. A is equal to P times E to the RT. A is equal to P times E to the RT. So in this case here, your A is going to be equal to P, which is uh, 10,000, times E to the R, that's going to be 0 0.08, times T, which is 5. So here we do 10,000. Now for the E, remember second LN for the E, 0 0.08 times 5. Press enter. So the accumulated value would be $14,918 and how many cents? 25. Second digit after the decimal point is a 4. To the right of it is 6. We increase it to a 5. So it'll be 25. So $14,918.25 represents the accumulated value of a $10,000 investment for five years at 8% compounded continuously. Are there any questions about problem number 7? All right, number 8 is writing... The equation log to the base 6 of 216 equals y in its equivalent exponential form. Okay. So this is logarithmic form. We want it in exponential form. So we start with the subscript of your log, which is the 6. Okay. The number after the equal sign or the variable after the equal sign would be your exponent for the uh, 6. So it would be 6 to the power of y, equaling to what we're taking the log of, 216. So log to the base two, 6 of 216 
equaling to y would be 6 to the y equals 216. Okay. Questions on number 8. Number 9 is 7 to the y equals to 200. And we're going to write that equation in its equivalent uh, logarithmic form. Well, if we're writing it in logarithmic form, it must have L-O-G in it. So here, this 7, which is our base in exponential form, will be the subscript for your logarithm. So it'd be log to the base 7. Or you can think of this, log to the base 7 of 200 equals this exponent of y, because logarithms are exponents. So log to the base 7 of the number 200 equals the exponent y. That's how we write that in its equivalent logarithmic form. Any questions about problem number 9? All right, number 10 on the next page. We're to evaluate the expression law to the base 2 of 64. Okay. And the way we evaluate law to the base 2 of 64 is this. I would take this expression and set it equal to some variable. And in this case, I'm going to let it be equal to y. And then write this in its equivalent exponential form, which is in this case 2 to the power of y equal to 64. So I want to know what value of y where 2 to what power would give me 64. Well, since 64 is a multiple of 2, what I'm going to do here is divide 2 each time. So when I divide 2 into 64, that's going to go 32 times. And then 2 goes into 32 16 times. 2 goes into 16 8 times. 2 goes into 8 4 times. 2 goes into 4 2 times. And then 2 goes into itself 1 time. So now, how many factors of 2 do I have? Six. So 64 can be written as 2 to the 6. So I have 2 to the y equaling to 2 to the 6. Now, there's a rule that says if these bases are the same, I can take this exponent and set it equal to that exponent. So I can set y equal to 6. And that would be that missing exponent for log to the base 2 of 64. So in conclusion, log to the base 2 of 64 equals 6. And that's because 2 to the 6 does give me 64. All right, questions on number 10. All right, number 11, 12, and 13, you're to evaluate or simplify each expression using those uh properties of logarithms, those basic properties of logarithms. So in number 11, we have log to the base 10 to the 7th. And I want to know what that's equal to. Well, that follows this property. If I have log of 10 to whatever my exponent is, it will be equal to that exponent, okay? Because that's like log to the base 10 of 10. They're inverses. So what's log of 10 to the 7 equal to? 7. Questions about number 11. All right, number 12, ln of e to the 9th. And this is another one of those inverse properties where if you have ln of e to whatever your exponent is, it's going to be that exponent. So what would ln of e to the ninth be? 9. Okay. Questions about problem number 12.
And finally, number 13, you have e to the ln of 7x cubed. That property follows the fact that if you have e to the ln of whatever, that's going to equal to whatever. So what would ln of e to the 7x cubed be? Just 7x cubed. Again, e and ln are inverses of each other. Okay. Are there any questions about what will be on your exam number three?